Exploring Worldviews. Now, you may be familiar with the movie The Matrix. And this movie is a deep philosophical movie about finding truth. Here is a famous scene from the movie that has changed a lot of people's perspective on how the world really works. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice. Tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? You could say that. I can see it in your eyes. You have the look of a man who accepts what he sees because he is expecting to wake up. Ironically, this is not far from the truth. Do you believe in fate, Neil? No. Why not? Because I don't like the idea that I'm not in control of my life. I know exactly what you mean. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Matrix. Do you want to know what it is? The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now in this very room. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What truth? That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. And that is the big question we're asking. What is the truth? But before you can know what the truth is, you must see what the options are. So, what does your world look like? In your world, you have a certain opinion as to whether God exists. You know, or you think you know, who loves you, who doesn't, what you value, what you think is cool. What does your world look like? Have a look at this. Can you see it? It's hidden. You must look very, very carefully to be able to see it. Can't you see it? I can see it. It's right there. It's... I hope you can see it. Otherwise, we are talking about two very different worlds. I hope you've seen it. Can you see there's a man painted exactly like the background standing right here. You can see his shoes right there. You know, sometimes when we talk about worldviews, it's like this. If you say to someone, uh, there it is, there it is. But if they don't see the world through your perspective, they can't do it. Sometimes that's my frustration as well. Um, I say, look, God has done this. And people go, no, nope, can't see it. 
can't see it at all because we look through two different lenses at the world. And for them, that's not even a possibility. Now, you create your own reality in your brain as a psychology teacher. You actually learn through perception that a lot of what you perceive is through the filters of your brain. This is actually not a real landscape. It's computer generated. Just that way, you create the world that you live in. Now, why is a worldview important? The really important reason is you behave in a certain way. Sometimes you watch someone and they behave in a way and you go, why on earth are you doing this? This is craziness. But the reason they do it is because they have a certain number of values that they think are the important things they're working with. Right? Those values influence their behaviors. They may say, oh, I value something. But their behavior doesn't show it. And it's because, in reality, they value something else. And that, what they value, is determined by how they see the world. If they saw the world differently, they'd have different values, and their behavior would be different. And that's why sometimes you look at someone playing up in school, and you go, why are you doing that? Because maybe they think school is worthless, because in their worldview, they go, hey, look at Bill Gates, he dropped out of Harvard. I'm sure I can become a billionaire. I don't need school. And that worldview influences their values and then influences their behavior. Now, one of the big questions to ask is, where do you come from? Where do humans come from? Are we just random accidents of evolution over a long time? or? Will we placed here by someone? Will we placed here by God for a certain purpose? Have a look at how the Simpsons start tackling this topic. There you go. <laughs> I love how it says Monkeus Italotus, Chimpus Imbecilus, Apius Stupiditus, Neanderthal, and Homo sapien. Now, if you are just a glorified ape, you need to behave in a certain way that is fitting of what you are. If you are not, maybe you need to behave in a different way. Now, it's fascinating. We are the richest, fattest, uh, most educated people ever in the history of the world. Yet we've got higher levels of depression than have ever been measured. Here is just something I came across which I find really fascinating. Lila says, I'm openly telling the world I'll be gone so for all you nasty people that couldn't wait for this moment, congratulations, here it is. And then her friends are trying to support her. And Dover says, Lila, please don't do anything stupid. We all love you. And whoever could, couldn't wait for this moment can go die. Seriously, they don't even deserve to live. I love you, Lila. Please don't do anything. And then, of course, Caleb goes, you spelled congratulations wrong. Um, you have to ask, oh, Caleb. How can you still troll this poor girl going through all this hardship? And those are the two extremes. The people's world views clash right there. For Lila, she is feeling at the end of her rope that she doesn't want to live anymore. For Caleb, he just sees the funny point in it. Now, how has life for a teenager start, changed over the years? I'll go through a quick sweep of the past few decades so that you can have an idea of how we've evolved to where we are now. You know, life as a teenager, you can't really see what it's like because you're like that fish. You are a product of the society you live in, and like that fish swimming in the river, you can't see it for what it is. So in the 1950s, what was cool? You would hang out at the milk bar. They were concerned about atomic bombs. People got TVs. That was amazing. Almost everybody's mum was a stay-at-home mum, and everybody dressed up in suits wherever they went. In the 1960s, there's a revolution and a rebellion. Suddenly, violence starts coming into the movies. The Vietnam War is a great concern for them. Um, a lot of activism starts rising up. Fish and chips becomes all the rage. The miniskirt, and of course, Twiggy as a model, changed the way that women's bodies were viewed and caused 
a lot of eating disorders to this day because she was the super skinny girl and it went from the girl with the hourglass shape to the super skinny girl in the 60s. Then, of course, the Beatles shaped the world. Mopeds were around, which allowed teenagers more freedom. And then the birth of the Hells Angels or the DuckTales, which started a, a form of rebellion. The 1970s is known as the age of the angry young man. Punk music, rock music rises to the fore. The heavy-duty technology of the tape recorder starts. It's a time of disco and Star Wars. Diet changes to meat and to veg because there is a heightened awareness of what you eat makes your life. 1980s, suddenly the birth of the yuppie. Young people want to become rich and they want to explore themselves. Back to the Future gives a new, bright vision of what the future could be. New technology like VHS recorders. Um, Walkmans, CDs, and lots of money in the, in the economy causes for young people to be able to acquire more than ever before. And loads of subcultures start, like punks, goths, chavs, and then, of course, the rock subcultures that permeated the, the 80s and the 70s. Then in the 1990s, my generation, suddenly, oh, and if you look at it, fashions have almost made a comeback to where we are now. TV becomes massive. Kurt Cobain and um, Marilyn Manson change the music scene. Rapping becomes really good with MC Hammer, and it becomes one of the main music sources. Television has a massive influence, and then, of course, Spice Girls. Culture changes. And the concept of cool is renewed in Vanilla Ice as young white men start entering the rapping scene. The 2000s ended up being quite a dark age. It was interesting. People were excited about the new millennial, millennium. But it was interesting. It was the time of the Matrix. Goth and emo became very, very popular. Um, because I taught at that stage... We had lots of children where, for the first time, they could go online and be encouraged to self-harm and write poetry about how sad they are because emo culture had that right at the base. There was a lot of dark um, movies coming out at that stage, even the romance movies like Twilight. There's more, there was lots more concern about obesity in childhood and then social media just took off. Technology took a leap forward. There were big problems with eating disorders, much less than what we see today. And then, of course, Eminem was a new face as a white rapper. The iPad made its debut and changed the way we handled technology forever. As well as, of course, the Twin Towers. The 2010s was the time of hipsters, Kim Kardashian, Donald Trump, Avengers, lots of piercings, Netflix, Kim Jong-un. Gay marriage was celebrated. We had more refugees than we had in many um, ages before. Then, of course, technology, rapid rise of technology and China. Um, normal companies started getting into the space race through Elon Musk, Tesla. And then, of course, is the dress gold or blue. And then climate activism through Greta Thunberg and The Hipster. What will the 2020s hold? We've just started it, and we're starting with the Wuhan coronavirus, and I don't think the world will ever be the same again. So one of the questions we have to think about is, do you think that teenagers through all these decades were exactly the same? Um, how do you think Christian teenagers experienced and handled these changes, and what will determine how you handle your teenage years. Can you see it? Can you see him this time? Can you see the man painted like the background? Start with his shoes. There, you can see him now. You see, when our worldview starts getting the same, you can see more of what I want to show you. So, is our world just random? 
Um, some people go, oh, yes, it's true for you, but it's not true for me. Um, you can't really pick any patterns in the world. Is there something like truth out there? Can, can you actually make sense of what is happening in the world? And if the world is totally random, why are you not afraid that a whale will fall suddenly from the sky and obliterate you? I think it is because of a misunderstanding of relativity. Relativity means that one thing is relative to the other, but not necessarily that it is chaos. One thing is relative to the other. Yes, people differ. There is still an ultimate truth, even though we as individuals can't see it. Now, what I'll do is I'll stop right here, and I want you to quickly reflect on the, fo the following few questions on your activity sheet. 